Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the This Dot Labs podcast. Today, we will be talking about abstractions. Uh, but before we get there, let me introduce uh, my co-hosts. This week, uh, as with most weeks, we are uh, pleased to have James Spivey, Director of Engineering at Shutterstock. James, how are you doing? Good. How's it going? We also have Jared Overson, a director at Shape Security. Jared, how's it going? Great. Thanks, Rob. We have uh, Frederick Preck, a senior in a developer at this dot. Frederick, how are you doing today? Hi, Rob. I'm great. Thanks. I tried to roll the R a little bit less. I think I rolled it back too far. I'm going to find the middle ground some soon. We'll get uh, and my name is Rob Osell. I'm a senior developer at this dot lab. So I said we were talking about abstractions, but before we get to abstractions, we like to do a little bit of an icebreaker. Uh, it's been a while, so we'll catch up with each other. Recently in America, it was just Independence Day, which is a giant holiday. You know, at this dot labs, we work with a lot of people from around the world, and it's been really funny talking to those people about Independence Day because realistically, when you're an American, you don't think about it, but when you talk to people from around the world, you realize that Independence Day is really the most American day. It's Americans acting their most American. Uh, and and it really is the Ken Wheeler National Holiday. Um, <laughs> but so for today's icebreaker, it's not just about Independence Day, although your story can certainly be about that if you want, but it's what uh, is your favorite holiday and what kind of like unique traditions did your family have for any holiday? And uh, I'll start, and mine is uh, Christmas. It's always been Christmas in my family. Christmas has always been a huge deal in my family. Uh, but my dad was like a a famous procrastinator. And so the tradition that got started once we got older and, you know, we were a little less enamored by having the presents and like, you know, getting all the toy uh, magazines and picking out what we wanted. My dad would just uh, give us money. So he'd give us like whatever it was, like a hundred bucks or whatever it was for that year. And we would go out and buy our own presents and then we would return them to him. And then they would uh, go out shopping for Christmas dinner, come back. My mom would cook. My dad would wrap up all our presents. He'd put them underneath the tree. We'd eat dinner, and then we'd unwrap the presents. So Christmas took, like, basically, uh, it was, like, set up for a day and then and torn down in, in a day. So that that's uh, that was sort of became our sort of high school and middle school Christmas tradition. How about you, Jared? What, what's, uh, what's your favorite holiday? What did you guys do? Uh, I, I like Thanksgiving. Uh, it's a it's a holiday that doesn't come with uh, the requirements or pressure to buy a whole lot of plastic crap, and uh, we just cook a lot of food. We enjoy each other. We talk about things we're thankful for, and it's a it's a very uh, stress free, relaxing holiday that inevitably comes with some time off on work. Uh, so it's a it's just a, got a good schools off, works off. You just you chill and, and eat with your family sort of vibe. So we don't do anything wildly traditional, except, you know, all the traditional stuff that Thanksgiving brings along with it. Um, I guess the one thing that my kids do look forward to uh, on Thanksgiving is a whole crap load of eggnog, which is uh, fantastic for some and uh, horrible for others. Mark me down for horrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how about Frederick? What, what, what's, uh, what's your favorite holiday? What does your family like doing? Well, as I'm a recent parent, I'm mostly looking forward to any holiday that's related to the kid. Uh, he's only two years old, so we're starting to enjoy Easter, for example. Um, it's amazing seeing the smile on his face when he's out there in the garden looking for chocolate eggs. It's what we do. I'm not sure if, if other people do that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's so happy when he finds chocolate. Uh, he's also happy when he eats chocolate, but we try to do <laughs> that. Um, but other than that, of course, we also have Santa Claus. I'm not sure that's something you you celebrate, um, and Christmas, of course. But but mostly Santa Claus is, is is enjoyable for the kids. Christmas is more like for the the parents to, to eat, and also the, the children get their presents. But the more you most, dress up most as Santa, the, I did not yet. Uh, but he's working on the beard. Yeah, we're working on the beard. Happen. <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, and James, how about you? Mine's got to be New Year's. I've uh, I've always really enjoyed New Year's. There's something about getting rid of the last year, bringing in the new one. Everything's going to start fresh. The countdown, the the hanging out, the screaming with family. You know, the in the twenties, the all night partying, having fun, enjoying that new year. Uh, my parents, my mom has a tradition. You know, the very southern tradition of uh, eating things that bring you things. So black eyed peas uh, and uh, all kinds of other stuff that bring you wealth and joy and happiness. So she would always try to make me eat these horrible things that were steamed to death that 
now I kind of miss and go, oh, I wish I'd gotten more into that. But as a kid, you're just like, oh, this is horrible. I don't need this for New Year's. And then you realize how fun it is. I had never heard of that tradition. I thought it was a Southern thing, but I, yeah, I, I've known a lot of families that do that. Um, Color, do, do, collard greens and black eyed peas. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Do you get a lot into uh, um, New Year's resolutions or do you not believe in resolutions? Uh, sometimes I do, you know, not every year, but it, sometimes it's nice to say like, this is the year where I'm going to do X, Y, and Z and just set that as a goal, you know, and, and try to get it. And then you're, and then you realize that you waited a day to make that resolution and you're like, ah, oh, never mind. I don't have enough time. I'll do that next year. Yeah. I kind of cheated out recently and I started using uh if then this, that to, uh, to do the auto tweet of happy new year's every year. Cause I kept forgetting to actually do it. So, you know, <laughs> I guess my resolution wasn't as, as good on actually committing to it every year. Well, great. All right. So let's dive into abstractions and, you know, we always joke that we like to cover broad topics here on this podcast, and this is certainly perhaps the broadest. Um, so I just thought I would start out by throwing out a broad definition of the concept of abstractions, um, and then we could just sort of see where that goes from there. So when I think of abstractions, you know, one of the things that I think about is something that uh, obscures a more complicated process and maybe exposes a more simple interface to you or more something that's a little easier to understand. And so, for example, the way I think of it sometimes is in your car, you know that if you press a pedal, the gas pedal, the car will move forward and go faster, right? Now, to you, you think that the pressing of the pedal is the thing maybe that's making it go faster, but it, what's obscured is all the different processes that happen inside of the engine. Right? If, you, if you actually had to make your car go by compressing the gas inside of little tubes and lighting a match underneath it to make it explode and then compressing it again really fast, you, know, you, you wouldn't be able to do it or you wouldn't be able to understand it. But just thinking of the car as being this magical entity with a, you know, with a pedal that makes it go um, helps you understand what a car is, even if you don't have any knowledge of how an engine works. Uh, you know, so I guess I'll throw it out there and maybe James will start back with you. You know, what do you think of that? Do you think of abstractions in a different way, or how would you how would you apply that definition to code then? Uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty good one, especially as we you know we start talking about uh, drive by wire systems these days. You know that for older cars that doesn't work, right? You press the, press the gas pedal, it pushes a lever, and the thing goes and does a bunch of stuff. Now, drive by wire, you're pushing a pedal and hoping the computer figures out it needs to go forward. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Who knows? Um, you know, Tesla the classic example of that it being able to do it drive itself uh yeah i think uh i think from a high level um you you nailed that w what we're trying to most everyone that is getting into programming today has to deal with abstractions to a certain degree because we're not literally writing the code that the machine processes all these things that we javascript tells another thing to do another thing and we ultimately have frameworks on top of javascript that tell javascript to do things so we're just continually expanding this big balloon of abstractions to make our day-to-day -day lives easier. And so when I talk about abstractions, I try to keep it a little smaller about, you know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? If it's a big complicated task, do we try to wrap that in something that's much simpler, which we then we call the abstraction of that process into this bite-sized chunk. And it's really the art of finding where those chunks are that our day-to-day -day job revolves around. Great. Um, Jared or Frederick, do either of you guys have examples of, you know, abstractions or ways that you describe abstractions when you're talking about actual code or software? Uh, actually, I'm going to be stealing your example uh, with the car because that's actually a very, very good example. And uh, I feel like, I mean, uh, th this, this podcast on abstractions is going to be filled with abstractions as we make examples of things that are not related to exactly what we're talking about. Um, but I feel like that's that's one of the things that's really necessary when you're talking about how to structure code or or, or systems uh, is to provide examples that allow people to to wrap their head around concepts that they don't really need to worry about, but they do kind of need to get past in order to see where you're going. Um, so so I think that I mean that was a great example, and I, I, I will just be using that from now on. Well, um, I think. You all three of you pretty much nail it, um, but I think there's also another side, another side of the coin when we talk about abstractions and when you talk about frameworks and things. Um, it, I think it makes sense to immediately or, or 
pretty easily accept the fact that we want to use something and not rebuild something. But when you're talking about your own code, I think it's also important to be careful. It's not always useful to abstract something. Um, the car example is a very good example about it when abstraction is useful. But when building a car, hopefully, you know how the cars should be built up front, which makes abstracting more easy. Um, not saying abstraction is a bad idea, but I think we ha you have to take into account um, that you can't always know what what happens with your project. Um, talking about my own code now, but when you're trying to solve an entire issue or an entire problem for which you want to create a solution, you probably want to abstract that away uh, indeed. Um, but yeah, the, the bigger picture of abstraction is pretty much how I see it as well. Yeah. I I mean, I think with all things architecture, as we've discussed many times on this podcast, everything comes with a trade-off, right? So abstracting a problem and, 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 and you know, sort of abstract, uh, hiding some of its details is going to come with a trade-off. So on the positive side of that trade-off, you know, one of the things that I think about is in development, and I felt this a lot because I, I didn't do web development my entire career. I used to be a desktop developer. So when I came to web development, and even over the last couple of years, I just was like, holy cow, there's so much more to know than there used to be, right? All these conversations around performance and security and responsive design and things I had never even heard of, like progressive enhancement and, uh, you know, offline capabilities and PWAs and all these things. I just was like, how will I ever make a website? You know, like, how will I ever actually deploy something? I'll never stop learning. And I think that that is one of the things on the plus side of abstractions is that when you use something like a framework or a library that can handle some of these things for you, um, you don't necessarily need to know them right away to get the benefits of those, of those tools. You can sort of get this force multiplier for cheap um, and then later sort of backfill that knowledge. Uh, does anybody else have any other uh, advantages that they look to when they think of um, why they use abstractions, libraries, or frameworks on their team? I think the last point you just made is the most important on that one is the force multiplier. Um, we, we talked a bit about it before when we talked about architecture of open source is that a lot of these distractions, stuff like Angular and React, uh, Sentry is a good example. They, they abstract away different concepts and technical details that uh, become, that are typically repetitive tasks that are a lot of manual effort to put into place. Uh, Auth0 is another good example of abstracting away logins. All these tools, they, they abstract away very repetitive, very laborious tasks off the backs of a lot of people's really hard work and intelligent work that allow you to then put your idea into place. And so if you can use the right abstractions up front, i.e. the right tooling, the right frameworks, the right SaaS services that abstract away complicated subject matter, you can then build ideas faster, which is what we're ultimately trying to do is get to market with ideas. So I really like the force multiplier aspect of abstracting away ideas because of that. I also think that that when when talking about abstractions in terms of frameworks, for example, that if we look a few years back, that using something that you didn't write yourself might be kind of a black box. Um, but these days, a lot of stuff is open source. I'm not going to say everything is open source, but a lot of stuff we are using is open source. So even though you don't need to worry about the internals of the abstraction you're using, you still can. Uh, you can even work on it, improve it, fix bugs, bu bug fixes, debug it uh, locally. So there's a lot of benefits whilst not needing or need to spend the time to to to, to create the base for, for whatever the framework you're using. So I think it's definitely useful. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the level of abstractions that, that make up these frameworks right now, um, I, I started learning JavaScript and, and web stuff back in the mid-90s, I think, when, when JavaScript was, was literally first announced and, and uh, released, where you could actually like, script something in a browser, and it was awful. And it was exciting, but it was very, very, uh, very, very uh, immature. And then at seeing that grow over the, the, the 20 years that followed, uh, has allowed me to to progressively understand exactly what parts make up what and what these frameworks provide. And if you're jumping into these right now, there's a there's there's a there's a whole class of of prominent developers and loud Twittery people uh, who essentially kind of like gatekeep uh, productivity 
where you're not really allowed to use these frameworks unless you know all of what they're abstracting away so that you can account for it. And, and I think that that is, that is a sour attitude that is really hurting people from really feeling like they're welcome in the web community. Like all of this stuff that is, is being built to make people faster and to, to make better web applications, that's all you really need to know nowadays. You don't need to know all the crap they're abstracting away because that's crap they're abstracting away. Uh, so I think that there's a there's there's a lot of value, um, but I think we're we're kind of in a weird transitionary uh, stage, uh, community wise, where we have not been as welcome to those people who just know that as we really should. I agree. I saw a really interesting Twitter thread the other day. Uh, I don't remember exactly who it came from, but I believe it was from Google. And it talked about how, you know, an engineer needs to understand like the TCIP, you know, stack and all these other things that some of it being more obscure. And, you know, I'm sort of thinking about my day to day work and, and some of the teams that I lead and, and operate with. And I highly doubt that most of them, I mean, I know a bunch of my engineers know that stuff, but there's also a bunch that don't and they do just fine and they're great team members and I'm really glad to have them on. And I'd never expected them to know the inners of how IP stack protocol works. And so I think it is, you're very right that we have to be very careful how we talk about, I, I think this kind of goes back to that subject of black boxing where you hear that term a lot, uh, black boxing and, and, do you need to know what's behind the black box for it to be foundational? Can we work with it open source? You know, it, it seeing the code, you know, if it goes truly black box, we had like the Cloudflare issue where we don't know how Cloudflare really does their thing. We just relied on it because it was an abstraction away to do global hosting. And when it went down, we were all just down. There's nothing we could do to fix it. They had to expect them to fix it. Um, I personally am not really that afraid of black boxing. I think it's a term that gets abused a lot, a lot of, a uh, senior pride around, you know, if you don't know how every bar part of the inner being of the framework works, then you're not truly a senior. And I think that's the wrong attitude, like you said. Um, I like to know it. I think it's a fun thing to know. I think it's good to know if you can, but I don't think we should make it an ex expectation because just some things will be black box and stuff moves so fast. You know, I, if I were to try to keep up with every commit to Angular to know every line change and everything that was going on with it, that would be my full-time job. I would have nothing to do but reading all the commits that go into that, trying to understand everything that Angular is doing. And it is some people's full-time job. There are bloggers that do nothing but dig into the innards of all these frameworks and tell us high-level concepts about what's changing and what's new and what's what's old. Yeah, and I would throw one other thing on the on the sort of the negative trade-off side of abstractions, which is that. Um, when we kind of dance around this a little bit, which is that you don't have to know things in order to do things, right? You don't have to know how something works in order to do it. But the, the trade-off with that is uh, you don't know how to do that thing. Um, and this can create an entire uh, practice in programming called like cargo cult programming, or some people have called it stack overflow programming. Um, it, it, it's most frequently emblematic when somebody says, uh, you, you know, I fixed it. And they go, well, how did you fix it? And they say, I don't know, but it works. Right, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. But whenever I work with mentees, what I tell them is uh, once you've done that, like it's okay to solve the problem that way, but once you're finished, then take the time to learn why what you did actually worked. Because I know I've been burned by this before where we just sound, found some forum thing and they said to do something which to us looked completely inane, but they said it would fix the problem. We put it in, it fixed the problem, but it introduced five other problems. And then we had to learn why what they did worked, but also why it broke stuff. Um, so, you know, there's definitely this idea that you can get addicted to abstractions. And if you never actually try to look a little bit behind the curtain, you're somewhat beholden. They, they will always just be magical to you, what they do. And so, you know, you guys kind of were touching on this, but I'm actually really curious. You know, we don't usually do hot takes on this, but I'm there's this this uh, argument that goes back and forth between whether you should start with abstractions like frameworks for people that are joining the industry, or whether you should start by learning the platform. And I'm kind of curious where you guys fall on that. So I don't know, Frederick, you started nodding first. So do you have an opinion? Like, where do you fall on this debate? <clears throat> Well, I definitely think that knowing some basics, if, if we're talking about a framework and we're talking about Angular to take an example or even React, 
I think knowing a little bit of JavaScript, TypeScript, uh, HTML and CSS will help you. Um, if you don't know, I think I think it's part of using Angular. I think Angular is a framework that comes with JavaScript, TypeScript, and HTML, so you have to use it, so you have to know it. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to know all the internals of JavaScript. You just need to know how you can create variables, how you can create functions, methods, classes. Um, not saying that, that you need to know how hoisting works or what closures are. It, it will help you, but, but I think that to start with using something, you need to know at least something that it's that it's built upon. Um, this is totally something different than using Cloudflare, for example, uh, as James mentioned. That's a SaaS platform we're using. That's a black box, and that's fine, I think. Uh, Angular can be also a black box, which is also fine. But you still need to know yeah, how the browser works, how HTML works, and it will help you in the end. You can, I think you can start with Angular without. But while doing so, you will eventually learn HTML and JavaScript. Um, so yeah, I think I would prefer uh, digging into those up front. Um, yeah. I'm horribly conflicted, and uh, I, I don't know exactly what take uh, that is going to come out of my mouth, is whether or not it's going to be something I, I truly will stick to. Um, because on the one hand, uh, in business, you need to produce value quickly in order to get anywhere, and you're going to get there more quickly with abstractions. But on the other hand, I am very well steeped in the security side of things, and I know how much goes wrong when people don't know what's going on underneath the, the covers. And so many problems arise because of abstractions that make things easier, um, but then as soon as you venture uh, slightly on the edges, and you don't, you know, you know enough to be useful, but not enough to be safe. That how so many problems arise from that. Uh, so, I guess the the take is it depends. Um, if you're doing something that is at all related to uh, information security or security in general or protection of data or or um, secure communications uh, or anything sensitive then you need to understand what the abstractions are giving you um, and, and what the when you need to dive in and when you need to understand the implications of your choices. Um, but when it comes to stuff that you're whipping up uh, for, for quick purposes or for internal tools or, or just the simple web pages, uh, you don't need to know at all really what you're abstracting away. Just get something up, get it useful as quickly as possible. So I think I'm going to take the, I guess, the most unpopular or semi-unpopular view here and say that I really like the concept of teaching the framework first and not needing to know about the inners. And I take it from personal experience because I came to programming from a non-traditional route, not a computer science guy. I did go to school for it, but it wasn't a traditional computer science program. It was more of a design sort of program. And the thing that I liked most when I was first learning how to really dig into like this as a, as a career was I like building stuff and having it actually work. You know, I started back in the cold fusion and flex days and it's a pretty t technical thing that was pretty hard and you need to know some of the inner stuff if you wanted to do the really crazy animations and stuff like that. But when I had the basics of like getting a layout to work and then getting it to load some data and having this thing that handled actually getting the data for me and doing the pushes and pulls and I didn't have to think about any of that stuff, it let me build cool forms that did neat things and then start learning more stuff and, and building out my skill set. But being able to see something successful and actually push it out there and say, it, it may not be anything crazy cool, but it's, it's mine, I built it, it's neat, I think it's exciting. That enthusiasm, I think, is what kept me going, as opposed to I probably would have just been felt very drained if someone had said, uh, you know, you need to go learn all of computer science and all of these algorithms and all of these things that may or may not be relevant to your career. And, you know, if you don't know hoisting, then you'll never do this. I probably would have just stopped. I probably would have said, I'm, I'm completely out of this and I'm not interested in this. But the fact I was able to build something, see it work, put it on the web, it was like, this is exciting. I want to do more of this. And I, I see that a lot with the, the people that I mentor, you know, and, and teach, we, we've got this apprentice program that we've done where we get to show them a taste of what it's like to have some success and see this thing do something in the wild. And yeah, they're 
not going to know all the inners because they're using all these different abstractions that hide a lot of stuff that eventually they probably need to learn. But they get excited because they get to do something and they get to build it and they get to see it and they get to go, this is mine. And I want to learn more. I want to learn how to do that other cool thing that seems even harder to do and just dig into like this knowledge depth well that we have in the web where it's endless blog posts and things. So yeah, for me, it's teach you how to make something and do something, get that excitement going and then just keep learning because the learning is the important part and we're always, always learning. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I love all those opinions. We, we didn't, we didn't really lean into the hot takes here. So, um, and I don't really have much to add along those lines, but you know, it's funny because um, I started coding when I was like a teenager. I mean, whatever coding to, to an extent, but I started playing around with code when I was a teenager and I was like immediately thrust into the middle of what this version of this argument used to be back in the day, which was um, notepad developers versus uh, WYSIWYG developers or what you see is what you get developers. So I learned web development in Microsoft front page and uh, using the WYSIWYG editor, so the visual editor. I didn't write any of the HTML. Um, now, it's interesting because this is another negative of abstractions sometimes, is sometimes the abstractions can harm your ability to learn the underlying fundamentals because Microsoft Front Page was famous for filling your source code with completely unnecessary additional things that were very, to add its extra features that it allowed you to do. Um, so it, it didn't help me learn HTML very well at all, but it helped me build sites, right? So I think it's interesting um, even I never agreed back then that that didn't make me a real developer or that people that had to use one of those editors aren't a real developer. I think there are a lot of people out there that will learn by building and, and seeing something be built and having to solve real problems relative to their thing rather than um, talk about uh, algorithms and then figure out how to map algorithms to building real things, right? Learn the algorithm when it solves a real problem that you have, that kind of concept. But I will say that Saying that, I do think people need to have a strong basis in the languages. Now, it's interesting in web development, you know, some people will gripe whether CSS, HTML, and JavaScript are each a separate language, but just for the sake of this, let's say that they are, um, and it's really irrelevant whether they are or not, but the point is, is you need to know those things, the basics of how they work, like HTML syntax with opening tags and closing tags and attributes and, and that kind of stuff. You need to know JavaScript syntax and how to write loops because if you jump immediately to abstractions, I've seen people with, they don't have the proper coding background, they get so confused by the abstraction, it didn't help them. They have to learn up to the abstraction um, and maybe they would have learned faster in another method. You know, the, the, It's only a force multiplier if you know how to actually use the tool. Um, so I'm kind of one of these people that I think like you need to have the coding background, then the abstractions, then you can learn the platform stuff, in my opinion, because I'll say that I'm still learning some of the ins and outs of how headers and cookies and, you know, originally I had no idea how a cookie worked. I had literally, it was just black magic to me and it's only, you know, coming into focus, you know, much, much later on. You don't need to know a lot of that stuff. So I would say uh, in that order, but I, I, because I came from a computer science background and I did desktop development first, I don't know what it's like to know, learn web development when you don't know um, just coding practices in general. Like before I knew HTML, or before I came back to HTML, I knew XML, right? And then, you know, before JavaScript, it was C Sharp or C++. So it's like, I didn't have to go through those struggles. So I don't remember what that's like to come to web development and not come with anything. Um, but the last thing I would say on this is, uh, if you are just building websites, um, question whether you actually need abstractions to do them at all. <laughs> uh, you know, you don't actually need Angular for a Hello World app. Um, you also don't need it for a resume site, um, probably, right? But um, you can do it just for the practice of it, but you probably don't need it. You know, you're kind of wielding a chainsaw when you want to trim some nose hairs, right? Like you, this is not uh, something that you probably need. So that's the other trade-off with abstractions is sometimes they can be much larger than uh, than what what you need to solve your problem. They are they're uh, you know a, a much bigger solution to a, a small problem potentially. You're getting into the one of mo one of the most famous Angular conversations I think there is right now, which is, do you need NGRX or do you need state management? And there's a number of great talks out right now uh, from a number of great teams that have covered this subject in depth. But it's it, you know state management's the new hot button subject in in Angular world at least, uh, and in a couple other places. And it's like, do we need this? It, do we need this extra weight? Uh, that goes on top of this. 
Uh, and some people argue, oh, it's it's pointless, it's horrible, it adds all this extra code, and uh, sorry, Brandon, boilerplate, you know, whatever the argument might be. And then there's others that say, oh, it decouples everything and it makes your entire data flow really, really smooth and, and you need this thing and you need to have it. And then there's another new state library that comes out and it's the hot new abstraction. And there's another state library and it's the hot new abstraction. And so everyone's jumping around trying to find the new hot abstraction out there. And it's, uh, do we need this? Do we not need this? And and I don't, I think the community is still trying to truly explain. And it goes back to your, Jared, your, your statement of over, it's always, it depends. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And it's, there's not a great answer for every single situation of exactly when you need it and exactly when you don't. Did you want to introduce the concept of state management briefly or? Sure. Kind of just for people that yeah. are kind of like, I've never heard of that library or I'm not an Angular developer. Sure. Yeah. The, the standard practice in Angular, right, is that you can call this service, say, I want some data and it just returns you the data. And you can call that from any view that you want and just gives you, gets the data and then returns it. And you've got to store that data right there where you asked for it from and it doesn't sort of live anywhere else. Well, state management takes that data and puts it somewhere else. It puts it into a store that we can talk to from different places so that you know, we can call it from one view and get it at another view and share it across different views and do that efficiently. Uh, and NGRX uh, abstracts a lot of those, these high level concepts of uh, re reactive uh, Redux programming um, to move the way the data works so that it works where you're, you're not necessarily going back and forth, but it kind of does like a big circle. Uh, you ask for some data it goes and does some things on the side and then some data comes back, but it's, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one type relationship. I think that's the simplest way to describe it. If anyone wants to correct me, please feel free. I will say that one thing that I, I do when I introduce the concept of state, um, we did some work uh, with, a, with a Google team um, with, on AMP, AMP documentation. And when we were doing some training documentation, we introduced the concept of application state. So we talk about state management, what is state? And I think the best way that I came up with to describe it is if two people are looking at the same page, right, the same URL, theoretically, by the dictates of the internet, when you, when you have a URL, it's supposed to reference a particular document and you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to retrieve that same document. So if two people look at the same site and they see different content on that site, what is different between their two sites is described by at least one piece of application state. So when you both log in, when we both log into Gmail, we, we type the same message, the same URL at the top, but like what my login name is, what my emails are, you know, who my contacts are, what hangouts I'm in the middle of, uh, that is um, all described by one or more pieces of application state. So it's all the dynamic pieces of your app that are, don't come down with you from the server, but are changed as people interact with it. Another very good use of state management. <laughs> uh, I also, else. Sorry. Go ahead, Frederick, please. Sorry. I also think that uh, it's correct to say that it depends if we need NGRX or, or not. It depends on, on, on the application or whatever. Uh, but I, I tend to, to say that it doesn't depend if you need state management. I think you always need to cons think about your state and your state management, even if the answer is I don't need a store or I don't need anything centralized, I, I just need my services. I think it's important that you that you know you don't need that. Um, but I think that NGRX or, or alternatives can be useful. Uh, I've used them and I've enjoyed using them, but I've also worked on projects where I've been working on getting rid of some stores, some actions, some effects that all were used only in a single component we are only doing some round trips for no reason. Um, I understand the, the benefits it could have uh, for that project. It was better off if we got rid of that. Um, but I think the real issue with NGRX is that as cool as I think NGRX is, I think that it's hard to, it's a hard exercise to lay down your store, um, to structure your store and ensure that everything makes sense. And that is not to blame NGRX at all. NGRX is amazing, I think. It's most, yeah, it's probably even me that, that, that fails in, in keeping it structured and, and keeping it in such a way that the next developer understands the store the way I did. And I think that's an issue when you're starting to abstract everything in a store that makes sense for you, but doesn't make sense for anybody else. Then eventually people will come after you and 
hate on NGRX because, yeah, it sucks, but it doesn't. It's mostly the, the, the application of the structure. Sounds like you need distractions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's worth also saying that NGRX, we're talking this in Angular context, NGRX is also built around, I mean, you might have heard words like Redux or Flux um, or, or MobX. Uh, any of these types of things are, they're different solutions to the same general problem of state management. But, um, you know, one thing that's interesting about tools that are uh, abstractions for state management, things like NGRX or Redux, is that in my opinion, they're double abstractions. So the library itself abstracts over the top of state management and helps you man maintain state, but it enables you to build an abstraction around your business logic that you can then give to your other team developers. And this is kind of what you're talking about, Frederick, and, and I think James as well. I think this is what the whole conversation about this is. To the first level abstraction to help you manage your state, it's like, great. But then you need a, an a experienced developer, or a wise developer, or just people that have taken enough hits of doing it the wrong way to set up the proper structure of your state that then your other developers can come in and use that and build views very efficiently. Um, so again, the way that I describe this one, which I love, uh, and I love that this you, you're, you're so right at the beginning, Jared, that this is just going to be a podcast of talking about abstractions to explain abstractions. Is um, did you, have you guys ever? I mean, you've seen them probably. But have you guys ever owned an Amazon Dash button? No, nope. mm -mm. like one of the. You know, do you know what they are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for anybody else, the Amazon Dash button is this idea that Amazon had that they would just send you a little button, and when you press the button, uh, it would go out and order the product that was depicted on the button. So, if you needed new detergent, you could have a detergent dash button. You could put it next to your your washer, and whenever you were low on detergent, you just press the button, and it would automatically order new detergent for you from Amazon. And um, you know, to me, that's exactly what these state management libraries enable you to do if you use them the right way. Is it's just handing your front end developers or your your UI developers just this bucket of dash buttons, and going, do you need to add a to do to the list? Here, press this button. Do you need to remove something? Do this. Do you need to log out? This. Log in. This. Right. And. All these developers need to do then is just hook the UI, well, just, I mean, not to minimize it, it's not easy, but it, all they have to do is hook the UI up to use those buttons and the rest sort of happens. Again, they don't have to know, it abstracted all the potential servers that they needed to be contacted and the error handling that needed to happen. Um, and all they had to do is just sort of activate this little button and it, and it kicks into place. So that's what I think is super powerful and I think um, when I only thought about state management as a way to manage state, I got super excited and then I got super dis disenfranchised with it. I was like disenchanted. And then all of a sudden I thought about this idea of it being an abstraction for the developers and then really played with that some more. And I was like, I got like re-excited about it again. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, you're touching on the, the core part of why those things are important. You know, my, my team at Shutterstock, the, the central purpose of what we do is to build those button abstractions. We we help service under a mono repo a number of other teams doing state management and localization and all these other things that we do. Uh, we help to build those buttons for all these teams so that they can go to market faster with their ideas. You know, and, and it's, it's definitely a lot of work uh, and we, work off the backs of others that have built stuff like React, which is their own version of pushing the buttons. But it it is, again, back to the original point, that force multiplier of, you know, having state just there for you. So you don't have to even, sometimes like in our case, you don't even have to worry about pushing the button. The, the framework pushed the button for you and returned the things. So all you cared about was just listening, you know, waiting for that package to arrive. And, uh, you know, that can be really, really powerful, but it's also really difficult at times when something goes haywire with it, there's a lot of, okay, where is it going haywire? And trying to dig down through, and you know, and I think state management's a, a critical example of that because it, I think as Frederick said, it gets a lot of flack sometimes for overly complicated state or difficult state, you know, poorly designed state, whatever it might be. Uh, if, if something gets transformed wrong or wasn't truly immutable or whatever else goes wrong in that piece, it can be very hard to find where it's going. If if my only job is just dispatch this event and then wait for it to show up, if something, if it doesn't show up or it shows up wrong, it's like, where do I go to figure out 
how and what happened to it? How do I trace this? How do I go dig down into the, the core and, and look and logically make sense of where that went? And that can be really time consuming when it happens, um, especially when you uh, compound it with other concepts like RxJS or whatever it might be. Uh, it can get really sticky, really quick to debug something that's that deep of an abstraction, which is when we get back to where you can have disadvantages and why there are talks saying you don't need state management because when it does go wrong, it can cost you even more than you thought you gained. So if, if abstractions are powerful tools for teams, force multipliers, if they help teams do things that they otherwise couldn't do, um, one of the things that we said is that it's always great to have somebody on the team that maybe can see through the black box, understand the fundamentals so that if somebody does go wrong, they can help debug it or understand it. It's not magical to them. But for the teams that don't have that, um, you know, the alternative would be they just don't build anything, right? So like how, how would we suggest or how do you guys suggest teams that maybe they're at the point as a development team that across the board, nobody understands the magic. How do they, you know, how should they proceed or what steps should they take to mitigate the negatives of maybe using powerful abstractions that they don't fully understand, but that they need to deliver a product? Jared, what do you, what do you think about that? Because I know, especially with security, that's a huge one. <laughs> Yeah, I think that it's 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 very very tough, and I think we we covered a bit about this in the architecture podcast um, where we talked about just I think it was architecture where we talked about like what an architect is, uh, seniority, and and uh, what they add to a team. And I think this is where a lot of that experience comes into play is just seeing what abstractions have worked out in the past and and what abstractions haven't. And I think a lot of people uh, kind of forget that we are still in the extraordinarily early ages of computing as, as, it, as it relates to the entirety of human history. We have just what a handful of decades of computing experience under our belts. And for the people who are most senior, um, who have 20 or 30 years of experience, they've been working with computers for like half of the, the, the lifetime of computing. So there's there's a tremendous amount of experience that comes along with that um, that can that can help guide a team into the right abstractions. Uh, but if you have a junior team and you can't get somebody senior, uh, then you're going to you're going to fall into a lot of traps and pitfalls that you could avoid otherwise. Those are okay, but you have to budget for them. You have to acknowledge uh, that you're going to make some incorrect decisions. And you're going to have to walk back some decisions. And it doesn't mean that you're a failure or the team's a failure or anyone failed. It's just that you're making, you are, you're finding your path through uh, computing and, and architecture and software um, on your own. And that's just, those are the choices that, that management and leadership and hiring has to make when they make these decisions. Um, so it's a, there's no easy answer. Uh, you're gonna have to, to fail more, learn more, try more, um, and, and keep on forging your own path. Um, but that's, that's where a lot of seniority uh, benefits teams is just by guiding them around things that, uh, that they, to guiding them around traps that they don't need to fall in. And I think that goes to another really good idea and a broader point for this in terms of if you are stuck in on a just junior team or you're working with an abstraction that's breaking and you're not sure why, uh, in open source, when you file a bug, typically the request is build me the most minimal example of where that problem exists or how this is working. So if you're stuck on something and you've got this big legacy code base or a lot of code that doesn't make sense, try to keep it simple. Try to iron something back down, take just the thing that you're having issues with and recreate that in as minimal steps as possible. Because then that will help you understand where things are going wrong. If, if you've got a transformation going wonky, take just that pit out and, and feed some stuff through it. I mean, this kind of goes back to our, our whole talk on testing is keep testing simple as, as little isolated bits. So, you know, in Angular, if we file a bug, we typically need to make a code example that shows exactly the behavior that Angular is doing with as little code as possible to show that it's broken. And then that helps people who are more senior be able to go straight to that problem, find it and fix it. Or, you know, maybe it is just a junior team that doesn't have that kind of access and they can just start learning why it's doing this thing. Okay, I'm going to debug local, like uh, Frederick said, and, and you know, pinpoint in, in the source code where I think this thing is happening and trace it through. That, that really simple approach 
will save a lot of teams a lot of effort and time. Yeah, I think it's also when you when you're creating the 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 the, the small ex reproduction example. I think it's also useful that that you often you, you may find that the problem is not even in the in the, the the framework you're using maybe you are doing something weird that you cannot reproduce and that's also interesting to learn from because you thought that there was something wrong with the the framework or whatever you're using but apparently there's not because you can't reproduce it and then it's interesting hard but interesting to know what you're doing wrong with the framework that's not behaving the way you sh it should and and i think Creating the minimal reproduction isn't only useful for for, uh, for for providing issues, but I think it's the most important thing when debugging something locally. Uh, of course, you don't have to pull everything out of its context whenever you're you're stuck. But when you feel feel like you're debugging something very hard, I think creating a, a side project, making it as small as possible, will help you understand the product project. Will also help you understand the framework you're using, and eventually maybe you just solve the problem without. Uh, needing somebody else. And if you don't solve it, you have a reproduction that you can just pass to anybody. You can even tweet it. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of benefits in doing that, definitely. Great, yeah. A uh, couple things that I would add to is I know that there are people out there that work on teams where either they're the smartest person on their team or they're just aren't senior people, like very senior people on their team. So there's just a bunch of people, qualified, competent developers, but they're kind of doing it together. And I think on those teams, you need to make sure, just like Jared was talking about budgeting time for making mistakes, is budgeting time to collaborate and learn. The worst things that those teams can do is be saddled to a schedule where they have to constantly be producing. On a team like that, you have to allow time for people to discuss both before implementation and then after implementation to both talk about what is the best path forward and after you finished, did we make the right decision? Would we make a different decision in the future? In so doing, you're still going to make mistakes, so you still have to budget that time. But your team will level up quite quickly. Um, you know, it's still better to have somebody senior that can mentor people there. But a team can get there by themselves. But they will never get there if they are constantly just throwing tickets over the wall and then moving to the next one because they'll just make the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over again. Um, great. So. I think we talked about this a little bit, but um, you know, there's been talk. Uh, there always is talk. This is a sort of a pendulum that swings back and forth with abstractions, where people kind of really are big on frameworks and abstractions and libraries and approaches, and then it swings back, and people are kind of like, "We need our own. You know, we need to. We need to. We need to see underneath the hood." Um, so there is this concept of premature abstractions, and it's a big warning that people have: is not to abstract too early. Uh, Frederick, did you want to kind of introduce that concept and maybe why people, how people might be, uh, how they should be aware that it's happening? Yeah, well, <clears throat> especially when writing your own code or when using abstractions like SaaS platforms, um, it's important to know that, you, as mentioned with the car and the pedal, uh, you know up front how that's built. Um, when you're building software, most often you have no idea of the entire entirety of the project in, in the end. Um, so if you take assumptions now that we may need this or we may need that, that may be wrong. And it may be faster by not doing it now the way you think you will later and come back to that eventually. Um, but yeah, that's a big discussion happening or, or has been happening for a while. Uh, yeah, I myself, um, I think it was back in 2013 that I that I found myself abstracting everything in my own code as a matter of learning, not in not in production code, but I was spending my evenings uh, trying to get everything unit testable, get everything mockable, everything through dependency injection. It was really crazy, I think, but it helped me understand uh, the benefits of doing so. But you also need to know that there's a lot of benefits in not abstracting stuff when you're not aware whether or not it will be reused. A good example is the the the, the NGRX I mentioned a few minutes ago that I got rid of the effects and, and selectors that were only used in a single component. You could argue that maybe it wasn't useful because it's not reused yet and moving it to the store once it's being reused can be easy or it cannot be easy. It depends on the application. Um, but I think it's a diff difficult discussion, premature. Uh, Abstractions, definitely. 
Anyone else? I, I, uh, I learned ages ago, um, probably from some senior person that I was working under as I, as I learned how to program, uh, that there was a, 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 an abstraction rule. Um, and uh, rules like these, uh, I'm hesitant to actually repeat because I'm not sure they're actually good rules. And when you repeat them, people remember the rule uh, without actually remembering all the nuance around it. Um, but for the sake of the podcast, uh, it basically, it was if you have to do something three times, then you should abstract it. Um, and that was something that that I learned, and I know a lot of other people have learned. That's very common. It's probably written in a book somewhere from some mega personality, and that's how it spread. Um, but I feel like that when you take rules like that and you apply them blindly, uh, then you get a lot of really really bad outcomes. And uh, I've seen that happen over and over again. I've done it myself where I've done something a third time. It's like, I'm going to abstract it. Uh, and then you get a code base full of uh, a bunch of weird abstracted bits that don't actually make up a, a well thought out system. Um, so I think that uh, premature abstraction, uh, especially from junior to mid-level uh, engineers, is more damaging than just copying and pasting code. I think once you've once you've built a system and you see how the system works and you see what is truly reused and what can be modified to be more uh, more alike, so that you can abstract something that makes sense away, um, that's that's a good way to do it. But that's all after the fact, and that's refactoring. I think if you're if you're abstracting before you've actually delivered anything, unless you know that it's the right abstraction and you've used it before and it has been battle tested, uh, then you're making the poor decision. Would you say that that rule was a premature idea abstraction? Uh, I think it was. <laughs> it, it, it was a it was a tweet sized rule, probably before Twitter existed, uh, and and it it caught on and stuck because it sounds good. It sounds right. Yeah, I, I, I the the canonical XKC because you know it's just like there's always an XKCD comic for everything. The canonical one here is the one where they ask them to pass the condiment. And he says, what's taking you so long? I asked you to pass the salt. And he says, hang on, I'm, I'm developing an algorithm that could pass you any condiment, right? There's, you, you think you know what the future will bring. And I had this beaten into my head repeatedly by a senior early in my career. So I used to just, I'd be like, I know, I know exactly what we'll need in the future. And you're wrong 100% of the time. <laughs> you are never correct when you try to guess the future. OK. Well, that's a good place to st that on that bleak outlook there. That's a good place for us to stop <laughs> this conversation on abstractions. Um, we'll make it a little bit more lighthearted with our closer. So uh, one of the things that we do a lot at this.labs is we work with a lot of aspiring and junior developers uh, through things like our apprentice program. And so we know that from talking to these developers that they suffer sometimes a lot with imposter syndrome. And honestly, so do we all, right? So um, you know, sometimes juniors don't think or don't see or don't realize all the mistakes that the people that are sort of quote unquote higher above them in their careers are making sometimes because they don't understand them to be mistakes uh, yet. But um, so in honor of that, and in honor of this talk about abstractions, my question is, can you guys give an example of one of your greatest uh, sort of boneheaded coding moves or one of your worst premature abstractions or leakiest abstraction or whatever you want to do? So Frederick, why don't you start? Well. Definitely not related to abstractions, but to give you an idea about how bad it can get, I I once had a QA applica application uh, on a QA environment that was configured over the weekend by the customer. Customer spent the entire weekend configuring everything to make it ready for testing on Monday. And on Monday, I dropped the database uh, without backups. And yeah, that's you don't want to be the person to send a mail. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I dropped the database. So I helped him get up everything back up again, but yeah, gotta admit it hurt. Uh, <laughs> How about you, James? Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I have done some sort of infinite loop or recursion loop that ended up just eating up everyone's computer. And I had one that made it out to prod one time and we started getting phone calls from customers going, Every time I open your website, my computer freezes and you're just going, oh, no. And you go and look at it and you just see the browser just start eating all of the available memory as it tries to just stuff everything it can into this giant loop. And I just said, oh, man, 
that one somehow made it back QA my fault. I'm sorry. That was me. So for, for mine, um, I uh, had this really great idea for a unit test on a project I was working on. And uh, C Sharp had just added these like new dynamic keywords. So it could do some really interesting non-type-based stuff. And so I developed this test case um, because our program could save files. So it had to write out some objects to a file and then read those things from a file and turn them back into objects. So serialization, deserialization. And I, we wanted to test that that process was working correctly. So I developed this unit, this unit test that could introspect on all these objects' properties without, without having to program tests that did it for you, right? It would just know. And it would do a bunch of automatic comparisons. But if anything needed a more complicated comparison, you had to write it yourself. So I wrote most of them. But in the future, I said, you guys will have to write your own. But there were some that just never compared neatly. They just weren't meant to be compared. And so I had made a little... Uh, little um, array at the top of the file that you could add in a property name to and it would skip that property if it if it encountered one so what happened in practice right so well i should say when i did it everybody looked at it, they're like wow this is the coolest test i can't believe you figured out how to do that that's so cool and i was like high five and everybody i'm so great i'm so great i'm so great this test will save us so much time what happened is this test always broke because whenever you changed any object in the system it broke um, and then instead of going in and actually adding the comparators, what ended up happening is people always wrote their property to the exception list at the top. So not only did the test never catch a bug, um, but it was never going to catch a bug because nobody was ever letting the test catch a bug. So I spent like a week of time developing it and it cost people, I, I don't even want to know how much time it cost people breaking builds and then having to go add this exception to the top of this file. Uh, it was the worst abstraction I've ever built. Um, Jared, how about you? Uh, I mean, that, that'll... That, that's hard to top, but I think I might have something. Um, so one of my earliest jobs uh, programming, uh, I, I was in charge of exposing this uh, internal tool externally so that people could view dashboards and bind some sort of uh, authentication. So uh, you would you would be able to, to view the state and health of the system um, externally when you're outside of the company, very useful stuff. Uh, I had to extend it and I figured like, well, if it's proxying that thing, we might want to be able to proxy anything uh, internally, externally. Uh, and I spent probably about a week building this really, really fully functional, uh, very, very useful, essentially open proxy to any internal server accessible externally. And uh, I was proud of it. It was really cool. And I learned at the end, it's like, we can't do that. That is an awful idea for a million different reasons. And all the, the decisions that I was criticizing early on uh, made sense because it was really only there to provide insight into a very, very small subset of the surface area internally. Um, so that was a, I, I learned a lot about uh, security, uh, best practices, and uh, why not to critically judge projects that you dive into uh, too quickly. I love it. I love all these Start stories. The salt. <laughs> <laughs> I love all these stories. I almost feel like we should do an entire podcast, which is just like a campfire stories uh, of this, because these are these are so like you feel the pain because you've been there. <laughs> Everyone, the, makes the, we are stuff. actually imposters podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. All right, great. Well, that's uh, that's a good place to stop. That's a lot less bleak right there at the end there. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this podcast, this 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 dot labs podcast about abstractions. Uh, thank you to all of our hosts for joining us. As always, the conversation continues on Twitter or elsewhere. If you have any other questions or topics that you wished we would have covered on this podcast that we can cover in the future, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, my name is Rob Osell. You can find me on Twitter at Rob Osell uh, with an extra L. So it's R O B O C E L L. Uh, you can find James on Twitter at myspivey. That's M Y S P I V E Y. Jared, you can find on Twitter at J.S. Overson, so J-S-O-V-E-R-S-O-N. And Frederick, you can find on Twitter at uh, Frederick Preck, which is F-R-E-D-E-R-I-K-P-R-I-J-C-K, -E -I -I so that, that hidden sneaky J in there. So don't forget that one. Um, but as always, thank you, everybody, for watching and listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks. Bye.